investment banking. So at the time that I was in investment banking, um, it was, and I, I don't know how it is today, but it was like probably the most desired kind of path. And um, uh, when I was in, in business school, especially, I would say about a third of our class went to consulting firms. About a third of our class went to investment banking and a third went to you know, various other things. Um, and my view on, on banking was, and I still, I still maintain this view, uh, it, it was a great foundation and a great way to, to build a skill set, get a lot of responsibility, see a lot of things early, kind of be at the board level decision making, whether it's an M&A transaction, whether it's, you know, company deciding to go public. Um, they're highly strategic decisions and you know, it's all of the inputs and analyses and the kind of thought process that goes into those decisions. So um, that was always my my kind of line of thinking um, when I wanted to go do that. I didn't think I was going to be a career investment maker, um, but I, I did it for probably longer than I thought I was going to, to, to be fair too. So I, I was I did it for eight or so years, um, but I, I still think that that was a great foundation. And if I look back on my time there, um, not only does it give you, equips you with a lot of skills, but it also gives you a broad uh, set of skills where you can go and really do a lot of different things. Um, I still maintain that view. That's not the only thing that equips you to do a lot of different things. And if you want to be in product management or technology, there's probably better routes to go. But I thought purely from a finance um, and transactional standpoint, there's probably a, you know, and, and certainly as a segue into investing, it's one segue into investing. I, I think it gives you a, gives you a great foundation, um, you know, for if if you want to go down that path. Um, you know, as an investor and in like going like on the Andreessen Horowitz side, like the a big part of that platform is not so much. Uh, well, of course, it is the GPs making investment in companies, but it's also you know what are you doing for your portfolio companies after you make the investment, which was you know a primary part of my job. So um, I think how it differs from a company on a company you're. First of all, like the company is is growing and building and scaling, and it it looks very different year to year. You know, even frankly, quarter to quarter or month to month. Um, and uh, on the investment on the investor side, if you're constantly doing Series A investments in enterprise, for example, you're you're coming across the same challenges over and over. So I'd say a big part of that is you have the as an as an, on the investor side, you have the experience of you know, um, confronting a lot of the same challenges. So take like go to market, for example, um, of, you know, the first motion of selling to, you know, large customers. Um, what I did in the corporate development function of raising a series A um, uh, or raising a series B or, or whatever the case may be, like you have the experience of learning of all of these processes, having done them so many times. And so I would say that's, that's a big part. Whereas if you're in a company, you're kind of doing everything for the first time and, and rarely doing things for the second time. So there's only one time you're gonna raise the series A. There's only one time you're gonna raise the series B. And, and what I think a lot of people don't appreciate as well on the company side is those are very different um, experiences. So going and raising a series A is very different than raising a series B, which is very different than raising a growth round, which is, so they're going through all of these things one time and for the first time each time. And so I think the, the, um, the the burden was on us to really impart a lot of that experience and knowledge and helping guide them, guide founders and guide companies through those experiences, having done it before. And, and that's very different. And, you know, I think the, um, also the stress is a little bit different, I think. Like, so, you know, the founders, and we always had to remind ourselves too, like founders have one company, we have a hundred, right? So it's like, you know, like, oh, well, this one's not going so great, or this one's, you know, everything has its own challenges. Like just reminding ourselves, like this is their bet. Like you know, you, you have to kind of put yourself in their headspace sometimes. Of you know, when one of my primary responsibilities is helping them fundraise. Um, one of the things I learned over time was a lot of times, sure, they need help with the tactics and the strategy and like actually raising a fundraise or actually um, uh, executing on a fundraise. But a lot of times they just need someone to coach them through, like almost be their you know, be their coach, be their psychologist, let them like, everything's fine. This is actually, this is normal. So, I mean, that was a lot of what we did too. And so we had to remind ourselves. So I, I, I don't um, for a minute um, 
try to believe that uh, being a founder and on the company side, uh, you know, being on the investor side is the same as being on the company side because it's very different. But you know, through those experiences, we can hopefully help um, uh, founders and, and, and startup employees like having been through this experience before. I think the you know fundraising like take take it outside of kind of venture fundraising so you know kind of capital formation as it relates to the public markets has changed pretty significantly over the course of the last probably two plus years so I think really the advent of direct listings um, as well as you know even more recently um, the advent of SPACs as an avenue to the public markets has been has been really interesting so. Um, I think that overall, it's given companies a lot of choice as it relates to, you know, approaching public markets. I've always thought like in, in the direct listing process, my, my uh, observation on the direct listing was, it was really a decouple. So there's not a fundraising event. IPO has been a fundraising event. So you raise, you know, you raise money in an IPO and you're then listed on a public exchange. The, um, the big difference in a direct listing is there's no kind of capital raise. Right. So um, it's just a listing event and it's the decoupling of that capital raise with the listing, which I always thought made a lot of sense because, you know, those are those are essentially two distinct events of raising around and, and listing. And so it kind of decoupled them, which I thought, well, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that's a much more elegant solution. Now you've got a SPAC, which is essentially, you know, it's structured really as a merger. So you're, you know, it's a company that's merging into an already public shell company. Um, and, you know, get, gaining a listing that way, uh, which is, you know, it's a product that's been around for 30 years, but it's really an innovation and it's how it's used with growth companies and tech companies and the like. And you're really just seeing that in the last, I don't know, six months or so. Um, and so um, that I think is really an, another interesting innovation. Now, I think these two, these two different um, avenues, the public markets, direct listings and SPACs, I think they'll continue to evolve. Um, I don't think what you're seeing today is kind of the end state, but I think that they're interesting alternatives to an IPO. I think that, you know, the SPAC probably is more competitive with a later stage growth round, not necessarily an IPO, even though it's going to, you know, take companies that would have otherwise gone public, maybe it's, you know, a year or two years earlier. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting innovation and I think you'll see it continue to evolve. Last question I almost have to ask you is given your extensive experiences across startups as well as finance, what are your thoughts on um, more recent market phenomenon like with GameStop and some of these other stocks? Because there's always been this um, uh, this conversation that it's almost pitting institutional investors against retail investors um, and around ideas of, okay, if you're working with a lot of capital, are you just playing a capitals game or are you really adding value to the actual company and the business itself? So would love to hear your perspectives, not limited to GameStop, but also just to reflect on this phenomenon that's emerging more recently about retail, uh, the role of retail and institutional investors. Yeah, so I, I don't think I should comment. I, I can't comment on any particular company or stock or, or GameStop or anything like that. But what, what I will say is, you know, I think it's I think it's an interesting evolution. Um, I think it's uh, and, and frankly, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I, I think it's good to level the playing field a bit and have retail participation now if you know the phenomenon of day trading and robin hood and is more of a covid phenomenon or if it's a lasting thing i think overall um if it increases financial literacy if it I, I one of the things i like about SPACs, frankly is it more of a democratization of the ipo process where it gives a much broader swath of people um the chance to participate versus just an institutional product where you know the traditional tech ipo is basically shuts out retail so it, you know, if it's a phenomenon that, that levels the playing field, I'm all for it. Thanks, Jamie, for the insight. Um, I'd just be curious to kind of get your thoughts on the IPO market and specifically the one-day pops we saw this past year. So think Airbnb, DoorDash, Snowflake, right, that basically had a 100% run up the IPO day and then had another 100% run up the first day of trading for retail investors. How should founders or late stage VCs think about that? moving forward when, you know, transitioning from the private to public markets. So it's, um, 
you know, I, th I think you can, you can kind of go and see a lot of different opinions on it. Um, I, the, one of the biggest reasons that I'm a proponent of direct listings and of SPACs is that um, there is a, uh, it gives alternative to the traditional IPO process. And the traditional IPO process to me, uh, especially in tech and really sp speaking more specifically about tech, because you don't see a lot of these IPO pops in outside of tech. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you have a little bit of a um, oligopoly in terms of underwriters. So, you know, you don't, you don't, you basically see either Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or both um, as the kind of lead left book runner. And maybe there's a few exceptions, but by and large, it's, um, it's mostly, um, it's mostly those two underwriters or, or a combination of the two. And um, I think that leads to, and if you look at the, the way that IPO, um, the books are constructed, um, there's, you know, the large mutual funds are, you know, they, they're at the top of the list and, and they tend to be, you know, the, that top 10 and it doesn't deviate too much from that list. And so when you have that kind of dynamic where, um, you know, you have the same buyers and the same, essentially the same sellers, the like same underwriters on every deal, you tend to see a little bit of the outcome be more predictable, which, you know, it's fine if it's predictable and, and stable, it's not fine if it's predictable and you have all these big pops. Now, you can also argue that um, in the IPO process, only 10% of the company is sold and there's a supply and demand mismatch and imbalance, which is also true. And I think that's certainly a contributing factor. But um, one of the biggest reasons that I'm a proponent of the direct listing is that you have a true market-based price. You don't have a hand-picked price with hand-picked investors. So like, I don't necessarily think it's the best way to go, but I also, you know, I, I also think like, like it's a process that's been around for a long time. Um, it works and, um, you know, but what's right for any particular company will change. So for some companies, an IP, a traditional IPO might be the right answer. For some companies, a direct listing might be the right answer. And for some companies, a SPAC might be the right answer. And by the way, like there may be a fourth kind of evolution that we don't know about yet that might come along. And, you know, so we'll see. But I, I think the innovation in capital formation, innovation in ways to access the public markets, it's all good and it's all good for companies. And I'm glad that there's, you know, there's choice. Thank you.